Our topic for this session is mediastinal trauma. Our first case is a diaphragmatic rupture. This case actually has an associated aortic laceration. This is a combination of injuries I have seen on more than one occasion in my career. You see there the contour abnormality of the aorta just past the isthmus in a fairly typical location. The stomach is elevated and occupies the inferior portion of the left hemithorax. On a lower cut, you can see the spleen, also elevated, has a peripheral wedge-shaped hypodensity suggestive of a thromboembolic infarct, most likely related to the upstream aortic injury. There is also displacement of the viscera at this level as they pass through the defect in the left diaphragm. The kidneys also demonstrate these small wedge-shaped hypodensities consistent with thromboembolic infarcts and a very important indicator of a vessel injury. There on the sagittal is the intimal flap and associated pseudoaneurysm of the isthmus laceration. And there it is on the coronal. Note the elevation of the stomach and colon and you see here the free edge of the torn diaphragm. A cut further back also shows the elevated stomach and the elevated rotated spleen there again is the torn edge of the diaphragm above which the spleen is now resting. And another good view of those peripheral hypodensities in the kidneys, uh, suggesting an upstream vascular injury. So let's look first at the axial view of that aortic contour abnormality. Here is the elevated stomach, and there is the pinching or wasting of the viscera where they pass through that defect in the diaphragm. Here are the intimal flap and pseudoaneurysm on the coronals as well. Let's look at the elevated stomach, colon, and spleen. And here's a nice view of the free edge of the torn diaphragm. In my career, I have seen this combination of injuries, aortic laceration and left diaphragmatic rupture, on three occasions, and on two of them, only one of the abnormalities was successfully identified. This patient, unfortunately, did not survive an attempted surgical correction of that aortic laceration. Our next case is of an esophageal rupture. This injury as well is associated with an aortic laceration and associated pseudoaneurysm. You see the pseudoaneurysm here on the anterior and right aspect of the descending thoracic aorta, a little lower than the typical level for an aortic laceration. There is also a well-circumscribed collection of gas and fluid in the mediastinum. It is an interesting feature of esophageal ruptures related to trauma that the rapid expansion of the tissues causes the soft tissues of the mediastinum to knit together and contain that gas and fluid that are thus released. So in traumatic esophageal ruptures, you will not always see extensive pneumomediastinum. The coronal helps you appreciate that. There is the pseudoaneurysm and the well-circumscribed collection of gas and fluid. You can see the esophagus superiorly uh, enters into it. There is the pseudoaneurysm, and there the collection of gas and fluid. Note the esophagus entering that collection at the top, disappearing, and exiting at the bottom. There on the coronal is the pseudoaneurysm related to aortic laceration and a good view of the circumscribed collection of gas and fluid with the entrance and exit of the proximal and distal aspects of the esophagus. So that is an esophageal rupture with an associated aortic laceration. Our next case is also an esophageal rupture this one did, in fact, result in an extensive pneumomediastinum, which you see here on the lung windows. And there is a collection of mediastinal gas and contrast. 
relatively well circumscribed in the inferior mediastinum. There is a nice view of the actual defect in the left distal aspect of the esophagus. This is for you to appreciate the extent of the pneumomediastinum. And here is the collection of gas and contrast. I will scroll back up through that and let you appreciate the focal defect on the left lateral aspect of the distal esophagus right there. You don't always get to directly visualize that defect, but that shows it quite nicely. So that is another case of a traumatic esophageal rupture, this one with associated pneumomediastinum. Our next case is a traumatic tracheal laceration. There is extensive extrathoracic soft tissue gas, and you see a small defect in the posterior and distal trachea immediately adjacent to the tip of an endotracheal tube. Their relationship is all the better demonstrated on the movie, where you can really appreciate the defect in the posterior wall of the trachea immediately adjacent to the tip of that tube. This almost certainly was related to a traumatic intubation and can be related to an intubation done without removing the rigid stylus that comes within every endotracheal tube. So that is a traumatic tracheal laceration. This was successfully stented and the patient survived. Fairly similar case is this bronchial laceration. You can see again an extensive pneumomediastinum. And here on the posterior aspect of the bronchus intermedius, there is a focal defect. This was traumatic. You can see small foci of ground glass density in the pulmonary parenchyma as well. Nice view on the movie, allowing you to track that bronchial wall and see that defect very nicely. The direct visualization of a bronchial laceration such as this, it was an unfulfilled dream for many radiologists in my generation. And to see them this clearly now on modern CT scans uh, truly is a remarkable experience. So that is a case of a bronchial laceration. Our next case is a bronchial rupture. You see again the extensive extrathoracic soft tissue gas. There is a large pneumothorax on the left and there is significant pneumomediastinum as well. In addition, there is volume loss and near complete consolidation of the left lower lobe. You'll see tiny bits of air bronchogram on the movie, but it is to an insignificant degree. In addition, you are unable to track the left lower lobe bronchus here in the left end for hyalur region again. You'll appreciate that better on the movie. All of this adds up to a bronchial rupture, however, another great view of the atelectatic and consolidated left lower lobe and the absent left lower lobe bronchus. Note the presence of these rib fractures, which effectively bracket the left hemithorax. I have come to put a lot of faith in that particular pattern of rib fracture, and I take it to indicate the presence of an esophageal, diaphragmatic, or bronchial rupture. There is that atelectatic left lower lobe, and of course you can appreciate the pneumomediastinum and pneumothorax as well. Let's also note the failure to follow those bronchi and connect them with a patent left lower lobe bronchus. That combination of abnormalities, collapse of the lung or of a lobe, pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum should always suggest this particular injury to you, a bronchial rupture.
Our next case is an azagous laceration. You see a large pleural fluid collection on the right with layering contrast, all extending from a contrast enhancing azagous vein. There is the fluid collection with layering contrast, and we can see its source very nicely here from the azagous arch. I'll show that one more time. Right there, actively hemorrhaging. Well, the brisk bleeding that is apparently depicted here is obviously of concern. The surgical correction of this injury actually went quite well and this patient survived. Unfortunately, in following this up, I discovered that she died of a pulmonary embolism about four months after this event. So uh, it had repercussions so one might not have guessed. Our last case is a laceration of the superior vena cava. You can see there's extensive mediastinal fluid and here a relatively well circumscribed focus of contrast extravasation. That is extending off the posterior aspect of the superior vena cava and will be well appreciated on the movie version. There you see the extensive fluid. There is the contrast extravasation and only now the normal SVC. This was a disappointing surgical outcome as well. Obviously, this is a relatively lower pressure venous bleed, but all the same, this did come to represent a large focus of extravasation uh, in a relatively tight and confined space. And so at surgery, this was uh, effectively released and the patient was exsanguinated related to the difficulty of uh, controlling a jagged tear in a large venous structure. So that is a case of a superior vena cava laceration. And that concludes our presentation of mediastinal trauma.